I have an oboe. I really need to do something with the oh. oboe. I spoke to her at church. She was Jewish. And um, I, so she had to live, she had to be willing to take adult students. So she had to live close enough that I could walk to her place. And her, who's that? Her, her name is Barbara Cook in Atlanta. Oh, in Atlanta. She played with the Atlanta Opera. And she had a short career with Ellen. And, uh, yeah, so I studied and started in. I made beads in high school, and no, I, I have tools for weed making, and it's time consuming. Very, very time consuming, yeah. So I, in general, don't work on weeds with my hands. Dr. Kendrick has assumed. I go to a lot of different schools and do woodwinds. But I also play, I have clarinet and saxophone, so I do, do middle school kids. Um, I do college kids with flute. I do college kids with saxophone and clarinet. My tenants, the saxophone player from the Perimeter uh, College Wind Landlord sold, and they had so to, did you put they had like in two weeks to get out. In storage, you put your stuff in storage. Well, my house had outbuildings, so it's in the playhouse or the barn. Oh. <laughs> and I sleep there when I visit. So. Oh. Yeah, I wish I had a rental property. Sometimes they can be a big pain. No bells this week. No right, Michael. All no Michael. No bells. Maybe next week. Yeah. I got a couple pieces ready to go. I just gotta oh, do you pick the pieces out? Yeah. Oh, and you give them to Michael? Well, he has the same book, so we. Oh, it's a, I see. Yeah, it's a dual.
Good morning, and welcome to worship, and happy Bastille Day to anyone who happens to be French. Um, we celebrate a lot this morning. Uh, over the past several months, we've been bringing new folks into membership at St. Armas Key Lutheran Church, and this is one of the days in the year. There'll be another opportunity later in the fall, but this is one of those days in the year where we get to introduce, acknowledge, and pray for some of our new members. Uh, and so we had a lovely breakfast, um, which a number of you joined us at. It was a wonderful breakfast, so thank you to everyone who made that happen. Um, yep. But you'll notice that in the course of the worship service today, um, we're going to bring the new members who are here uh, up to the front. We'll pray together, and then they'll just introduce themselves to you so that you can start putting faces and names together. And so I can start putting faces and names together too. Um, and so that is something to rejoice over. Um, something not so rejoicing, um, two announcements to make. Uh, the first is that one of our beloved members, Lynn Neating, died uh, two nights ago. Uh, they had moved back up uh, to Indiana um, and, well, she's left us. Lynn was a lovely lovely woman and when we resurrected the altar guild uh, she was one of the first people to say I'll do it and she did it faithfully and consistently and of course has been involved in any number of ways in the life and witness of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. At the moment we don't think there'll be worships, uh, a funeral service held here. The family are organizing that service in Valparaiso but it is possible that something may happen here, and when and if it does, I'll let you know so that you can come and give thanks to God for her life and her witness and her love. Uh, Jane, I know that the two of you were like sisters. You said you met at 17, a lifetime ago, and so our love and prayers surround you this morning. Also be aware that in the prayers today and in the sermon, um, I will be speaking about the assassination attempt um, on former President Trump last night. Uh, this is an occasion where, where silence is not, uh, not possible, not right, not proper. And so we will remember those who died and those who were injured and those who were traumatized in that despicable attack last night. We'll remember them and hold them in prayer and, and I will make mention of it in my sermon. Uh, the uh, other announcements of today are found in this take-home sheet. Um, I've talked so long now, I think I should just ask you to read that. Be aware that the Midsummer Music is coming up in August. School supplies for community service ministry, volunteer opportunity at Harvest House with community service ministry, cooks needed uh, to cook meals for Resurrection House, young adult meeting coming up, uh, in July and also if you look at your leaser there's a lot written about it uh, on the third page SAKLC training to go tutorials we use technology a lot around here and we know that not everyone is up to speed on that technology and so read that and that will be a way to start and as you leave worship you'll see in the narthex on those uh, literature racks all sorts of materials also available online there are lots of ways that you can be electronically connected to the life and ministry of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. And if you need some help, this is a great place to start. And thank you, Lad. Thank you, Lad Skelly, for the incredible labor of love that produced those materials. <laughs> Last but by no means least, a warm welcome to anyone who's visiting St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church for the first time today. If you didn't visit the visitor's desk on the way into worship, please stop there on the way out of worship because we have gifts we'd like to give you. And in amongst those gifts, you'll find my business card, and the business card of Michael Bodnick, our Minister of Music. And if you need either or both of us in the coming week or weeks, don't hesitate to reach out to us. But again, welcome to worship on behalf of the family of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. And now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning is from the book of Amos, the seventh chapter. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be made desolate. Just lay waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is a king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord.
The second reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things to him, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. So that we, who were first to set our hope in Christ, might live for the praise of his glories. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah, and others said, It is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and had protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me oh, for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother, when his disciples heard about it, they came and took the body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. 
So it turns out that Jesus has no reputation at all. His reputation has been destroyed in the eyes of everyone except Herod. Isn't that strange? The religious authorities despise Jesus. His own family think he's gone crazy and have previously organized an intervention to try and get Jesus to stop what he's doing. And then last week we discovered that even in his hometown, all those people who loved him best, nearest and dearest, all the people that watched him grow up, that were friends with his family, they hear him preaching in the synagogue and they say, we don't believe this guy at all. So Jesus' reputation is in tatters at this point. And lo and behold, we discover that he's got a big fan in King Herod. Now, watch what Mark does here. This story, this whole passage, is sandwiched in Mark's gospel between the sending of the disciples and their return and the report they give to Jesus about what they did when they were on their missionary journey after Jesus sent them out two by two to go and do his work in all of the neighboring towns. Sandwiched between their coming and going, well, actually, sandwiched between their going and their coming is this text. And if this was a TV show or a movie, the bulk of today's text would be a flashback. So just watch out for the different time zones here. It starts out with King Herod, knowing he's killed John the Baptist. King Herod hears about Jesus and is intrigued by him and says, it's John the Baptist, come back to life. And then, at that moment, the flashback begins. Here's the backstory. Mark gets the backstory just a wee bit wrong. It's basically historically true. Uh, we actually have an account of this from an early Jewish historian called Josephus, who, I've got to confess, is not the most trustworthy historian that ever lived. He, he had a, he had a, a, a plan. He, he had a checkered life. Um, he wasn't independent, his hands weren't clean, but, but there is a Jewish historian, Josephus, whose writings survive, and, and he pretty much corroborates what Mark is saying. Historians can kind of corroborate it too, except where Mark gets things a little wrong. Um, the daughter um, of King Herod is named Salome, and Herodias uh, is not married to Philip. She was married to another one of Herod's half-brothers. Actually, Salome, the daughter, is the one that marries another half-brother whose name is Philip. I'm just telling you this in case you like historical facts to be thrown in and sprinkled amongst your scripture. In fact, another interesting historical fact um, Herod doesn't survive on the throne much longer than this story we're hearing. Um, Herod, about probably in his 50s by the, at the time of this incident, um, and let me just get the year right. I think it's 39. Oh, it is. I'm right. Amy, write this down. I got something right. In the year AD 39, King Herod is knocked off of his throne uh, by his former father-in-law. See, Herod was previously married before he married Herodias. And the person he, he was married to is the daughter of a neighboring powerful king. And he just dismissed his first wife and sent her back home to her father. Her father promptly took her back home, then invaded, battled against Herod, and threw Herod off his throne. Last historical fact, King Herod isn't a king. His father, Herod the Great, was a king. Herod is only a tetrarch. He, he has two little regions. One of them is Galilee. So he's not even really a king. So as you read this text, you, you should read it along the lines of King Herod. Okay. What's going on in this text? I think there's more than meets the eye. Remember the other week when we heard about 
Jarius' daughter, Jarius, the leader of the synagogue, who asks Jesus to cure his daughter. By the time Jesus gets to the daughter, she's dead, and Jesus raises her from the dead. There are words used to describe her as a young woman. It's specific Greek that could mean very young woman. And tradition says, well, Scripture says 12 years old. The same Greek used to describe the 12-year-old young girl that was raised from the dead by Jesus is the same Greek that's used in Mark's gospel to describe Salome, the daughter of Herod and Herodias. Artists have pictured Salome as a temptress, a seductress, that the dance she did was erotic and bewitching, and Herod falls for it. But this, historians believe, could have been a childish dance of a 12-year-old girl that just captured Herod's heart. It would certainly explain why when Herod says, what do you want? And she goes to her mother, and her mother tells her the head of John the Baptist, it's entirely possible that this innocent little girl is just caught up in power dynamics, just says, yeah, that sounds like fun. And, and childishly says, oh, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Actually, it's a big board upon which food at banquets were, were presented. That makes it sound a little different than we normally hear the story. Uh, Mark and Josephus only agree on one other thing. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus says that John the Baptist was beheaded for political reasons. Mark reveals it to be family reasons. Lustful reasons. Embarrassment reasons. Religious reasons. The other parts of the text I will rattle through quickly. You will find them in my weekly devotions that get published every week um, in connections. I've already told you that the account is sandwiched between Jesus sending the twelve on their mission and them coming back. Herod serves as a warning. His emotional swings are extreme. You know, one minute he just loves this Jesus, loves this John, loves the message that's being proclaimed, but then his mood swings and all his best intentions go flying out the window. What we remember him for is not his intentions, but the result of his actions. When Herod is deeply grieved by the death of John the Baptist, that's the same Greek that's used in Mark's gospel for Jesus being deeply grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a powerful word, a powerful emotion, and the two make us think of each other. John serves as a symbol of courage and honesty in the face of criticism and danger. Mark's repeated use of the word for, I mean, if you wanted to do a drinking game, not that you would, you're all nice people, but if you wanted to develop your own drinking game on this gospel text, uh, you could take a shot every time you hear the word for. But the word for in, in Greek um, is a preparatory word for an explanation. And so many scholars believe that this is a story that Mark needs to explain the meaning of to his audience. They don't know it already. He's not just, he's giving an explanation of John's death, not just a description of it. In classic Greek versus Hellenic Greek, ancient Greek versus biblical Greek, there used to be two words for birthdays. One for your birthday, you know, your natal day, the, the day you were born and everyone wishes you a happy birthday. And another word for birthday that means the memorial day of your birth. You're now dead, but you're being remembered on your birthday. By the time classic Greek gives way to Hellenic Greek, it's the same word that means either a memorial or a celebration. So when Herod allows all this to happen on his birthday party, 
our ancient forebears heard two meanings there. The celebration of a birth and the memorial of the dead. For that reason, and hence the title of today's sermon, some scholars call this a banquet of death. Okay, so that's where my prepared sermon ends. That, that, was, that was what I had for you. I was going to do a few arms and legs here and there, as is my wont. Far be it from me to ever deliver a short, concise sermon. <laughs> but after the events of last night, hearing, hearing that first lesson at Amos of desolation and destruction, hearing, hearing a, 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 an account of the banquet of death in the gospel today, and knowing what transpired last night, an assassination attempt on live television, uh, people gunned down, people dead and injured and now fighting for their lives. And there were kids in that audience, both those watching on TV, those physically there, now traumatized, a peaceful event and death and destruction and violence just <coughs> pops up like that. The, the scripture texts for today are appropriate, I think. How did we get here? What happened to the way people talk to each other that leads to this? Now, now don't get me wrong. The murderer will probably turn out to be either a fanatic or someone who's mentally ill. Because the violence that rhetoric leads us to seldom happens amongst us. When we start to normalize violence and hatred and retribution, when anger becomes our default setting, when scowling is our resting face, It impacts those who are weak and vulnerable or ill. We don't go out and do that stuff, but they do because of what we've said or done, because of the environment that we've helped create, the way we've normalized things that our parents would have been horrified by. In fact, Go back in a time machine, try telling your parents what it's like now, they would call you a liar to your face. They wouldn't imagine that our civil discourse could be so uncivil. But it also poisons us. I mean, it poisons us in that larger sense that I've just described, even though we're not the ones that will engage in that kind of violence. But it, it affects us because it poisons our relationships. We really are, each of us, the D's and the R's, the donkeys and the elephants. We're vastly different people. I remember a few months ago speaking to someone in the congregation who's a very good friend, love him to bits. And we were talking about prayers. And, and he said, well, that, that prayer's okay, but how come we never pray for and then he rattled off very passionately, but very appropriately. I can't remember how many, three or four or five things that were weighing heavily on his mind. Three or four or five of the most important civil and political things on his heart. They weren't even on my radar, you know. These were three or four of the most important things in his life. They didn't even make it in the top 50 of mine. I mean, night and day, I had no idea that he or anyone else particular just was nowhere in my line of sight, nowhere close to my heart, never in my thoughts. We were so far apart, and I was shocked in that moment 
Because I kind of knew his politics, and I think he kind of knew mine, but I didn't know we were so far apart. I really thought we were closer together than that. St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church has been blessedly spared a lot of the anger and division that other churches have had to endure or have been destroyed by. It comes at the cost of us keeping quiet. It comes at the price of us keeping our mouths shut. And sometimes that's a price I'm willing to pay. There have been times when I've been pretty unauthentic because I know I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to intervene. I'm not going to raise my flag up. I'm not going to reveal myself. I'm just going to go along to get along. And it works. We're all still together. But it means that even in this place where we profess to love each other, and care for each other. Even here, we can't have those conversations. And, and I don't mean from the pulpit. <laughs> no, no. If I wanted to destroy this church overnight, I'd stand there and say a few things. <laughs> no, no, no I, I just mean, even in a place where we suppo are supposed to love and care for each other unto death, we just keep strong. You know, we, just, we don't talk. We're not authentic. We haven't learned, even here, how to have those difficult conversations, but to do it in love. How to speak the truth, but to speak it, not shout it. So, if we're failing to do that, and we all love each other, what hope does the country have, or the world have? I mean, if we can't talk nicely, if we can't agree to differ, if we can't agree to discuss without demonizing, if we can't do that, how can everyone else do it? It has to begin with us, though. I mean, there's no other choice. It's, it's not going to spontaneously happen somewhere out of thin air. If, if there's going to be a healing, then we have to be part of it. Because if not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? As one famous politician once rhetorically asked. I don't think any of us are miracle workers. But here's some things we can do. We can disagree with someone without demonizing them. We can tell people when they're wrong without telling them they're useless. We can do what our parents taught us to do, which is put a guard on your tongue. I don't know about your parents. My parents weren't politically correct. They didn't live in some halcyon time. They just required that you watch your language, Kenneth. Watch your tone of... Don't take that tone of voice with me, young man. Oh, if I had a pound for every time. I can hear you rolling your eyes. Stop it. You know, we, we, were, we were taught... We, we know this. We were taught how to do this. We were taught how to treat each other with respect and care and kindness and dignity. We were taught not to dismiss the other. We were taught not to make a disposable something of the other. We were taught better. We don't have to claim some political correctness. We just have to listen to our mums and dads and our grandparents. They taught us this. We know it. We've just forgotten how to do it. no matter what party we belong to, we need to speak up and tell those in our political parties who don't know how to have a civil dialogue that they need to start learning it. We've got to call people to account, ourselves, our family members, our politicians. We need to stand up and say, hey, I'll vote for you. You've got to, you've got to tone that down. You've got to stop saying that. 
you've got to start talking the way I'm sure your grandmother taught you to talk. We'll, we'll disagree over policies. But we can no longer allow each other to be disposable. No longer allow each other to be collateral damage. No longer allow each other to be on the wrong end of the barrel of some crazed fanatic. It has to start with us. There's things we have to say yes to and things we have to say no to. It starts with us. With what we say and do and what we allow others around us to say and do and what we allow others who are our political allies to say and do. It has to start with us. It won't start anywhere else. It won't start any other time, any other time. Us, here, now. Because the gospel tells us what last night's news feed told us. That we're always just this far away from our best intentions turning into acts of horror. We're always just this far away from loving the other or wiping out the other. We're this far away from being able to lay hold to the truth and to righteousness but we're also just this far away from making someone else disposable worthless meaningless now this is how the sermon was going to end we are called to enter into the dance. The choice facing us, is it going to be a dance of life and love? Or is it going to be a dance of death? We can't sit out the dance. But we can choose the steps. Amen.
Would our new members please come forward to be recognized? Don't be shy, you're amongst friends. Most of us don't bite. Just up here. Now, of course, we all own a calendar and we know that this is July. So a number of the folks who've come into membership over the past wee while are either out of town on vacation or um, are up north. So we will be doing this again. You don't have to. You, this, is a, this is a one off. You're, you're, you're this and not the next time. But the next time we do this will be a whole bunch of other faces, but whose names are shared in the bulletin and in connections um, and in all of our publications. So you, you see the names of those coming into membership. Soon you'll be able to put a face to those names. But first, let us pray. Good and loving God. We give you thanks that you have sent these sisters and brothers to us. Now, having sent them to us, make us worthy of the choice that they have made to make this their home. They have seen something in us and something in this place, Lord, that has made them say, St. Armas Key Lutheran Church is the place for me. But Father, if they are seeking a family here, Help us to be that family. Help us to rise to that occasion. Help us to embrace them in words and deeds of love. Help us help them to join us in our work in this vineyard. Join their hearts to ours, their voices to our voices, and their hands and feet to our hands and feet, as together, Lord, we are your hands and feet in this world that so desperately needs to experience gentleness, care, love, grace, kindness, and our relationship with our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to just start on this end, and don't worry, we don't need the pin number to your to your debit card or, or, or rank and serial number. We, we just love you to say your name, each of you, ni nice and clearly and speak into the microphone so that the folks here and the folks joining us online can start to put these names to your lovely faces. We'll just start and pass it down, hold it nice and close to your mouth. Hi, I'm Garrett Sennett. Good morning, I'm Debbie Cernis. Hi everyone, I'm Rachelle Zimmerman. Good morning everyone, I'm Steve Parker. Carrie Parker. Jean Quinones. Walter Quinones. Karen Smith. Hi, I'm Gia Lancy. I'm Jerome Schwick. I'm Ken Blythe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, all of you. Now, you can help by calling us to account. We've said that we love you. We've said that we rejoice that you're here. Hold us to that. But give us that opportunity to love you back. Thank you. You may take your seats. Congregation may rise and a round of applause, please. Thank you. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Is my hair okay? <laughs> Thank you. I will invite the congregation to remain standing as our new members return to their seats. And now I invite you to join with me in confessing your faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of the church, the world, and one another. Father, we give uneasy thanks for prophets and martyrs. They're hard to listen to, much less imitate. Remind us that your grace is sufficient in the inheritance you have stored up for us in Christ is eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful as you judge your church. Give bishops, pastors, and theologians the courage and faithfulness of John the Baptist. Let your word of law and gospel be proclaimed to all people. Lord, in your mercy. Like John the Baptist, many of your servants are suffering today, including Carol Anderson, Bob Kastner, Jonathan Clements, Karen Creston, L. Eunice, Steve George, the family of Nancy Jones, Chrissy Kelly, Joelle Quimby, Andrew Savage, Judith Neubauer Worsley, the people of Holy Land, and the people of Ukraine. Keep them steadfast in faith, bold in witness, patient in suffering, and joyful in hope, always giving thanks to their Savior, Lord, in your mercy. Keep this congregation faithful to our mission to proclaim Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Make our words wise, our actions gracious, so others want to meet the Lord we love. Lord, in your mercy. Prosper the work of all who defend life and liberty here and abroad. Make them strong, competent, and faithful. Grant healing to those who are injured and honor to all who have died in the line of duty. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Scripture speaks of desolation and violence, but it also speaks of grace and a promise of the seal of the Holy Spirit. And so, as we hold in our prayers the family of those killed and injured in the course of yesterday's assassination attempt, and those traumatized by such unspeakable violence, we also resolve to be instruments of love, peace, and grace as we yearn for our redemption as God's own people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear and graciously answer our prayers, dear Lord, as it is best for us and most glorifies your holy name. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. And all who love Jesus are invited to join us at his table this day. Come. Please be seated.
Please stand. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, you are the body of Christ. <laughs> 